In today's video, we struggle to restore what was lost, the industrial paradise. While Robert reigns on the moon, we have to build up our arsenal, build up our production lines, we have to build up our revenge. Join me as we reinvent old technology and discover new ones as well. Progress will triumph again, because today we are doing 600 days in the Create Mod. You want to play mod packs with friends, but you can't seem to find a good server. And the free ones? With the big mod packs these days, free servers are just too laggy. Luckily for you, there's Bisect Hosting. They host my server, and with plenty of affordable options, they can host your server too. And the best part is, they support almost every mod pack. Use code DOUBLESAL at checkout for 25% off your first order. Bisect Hosting, a great site for great servers. Today I'm going to start by making some tools, and while they're not the best tools, they will get the job done. I use my trusty Tinker Smeltry setup, and yes it was small, but it was effective. So I began making a brand new axe, as well as a shovel that was going to help me terraform for a brand new project that we were about to begin. This shovel was going to be powerful because it could mine in a 3x3 radius, and this axe was powerful because it could chop down most trees with one swoop. So I left the workshop and made my way to the new work site where I was going to begin construction. And one by one, each tree began to fall. Soon we were going to be able to build without any worries of these ugly, annoying trees being in the way. With the trees now gone, I began flattening the ground, and though it looks fast, the shovel was incredibly slow, so yeah, not my best work. But I began making the ground nice and flat. There you can see a beautiful plane ready for building. Speaking of building, I had to build up my supplies because things were dreadfully low. But once I had enough tools, it was time to start construction on the foundation of a new iron farm. Now previously I had built an iron farm on stream, I didn't like the design, so I was starting all over again with a brand new building and a simple design that I took for my steampunk world. Only this one was going to be a little different, but it implemented the same concepts. Cobblestone generator, millstones, and a fan to wash gravel to make that iron nugget supply that we dreadfully need. Honestly, this took me way longer than it should have because I was trying to get the most out of the little that I had. But besides that, I was going to have to make a power source. And this time, we were going to evolve. No more water wheels, at least for now. We were going to make steam engines. And to make steam engines, you need fluid tanks to hold water. Once you have the base down, the next thing you have to do is supply the fluid tank with water and heat. So we supplied the heat with campfires underneath and of course water which was being pumped with the help of a water wheel. So yeah, sometimes you do need them. Finally, the machine was up and running and the fan was finally blowing the water forward. Now this ended up being kind of a small setup, at least small compared to what we usually build. So I ended up building two of them to double the output of iron. Up at the top, we have a pair of dual cobblestone generators. Once the cobblestone is broken, the millstone's grounded up into gravel, which goes down these chutes, and the gravel is then transferred onto a depot where it's washed by water. The water then converts it into iron, or it converts it into flints, and both are sorted with the respective chests. The last and final thing to do was to convert all of these nuggets into iron ingots. I was going to do this with a mechanical press, and once they were converted, they were going to be stored in a crude storage unit where we could use them for later. Well, there you have it, the final iron farm setup. The only thing left to do now was to build the rest of the building because all of our machines were exposed to the elements. Of course, there are no elements in Minecraft, but you know, it still looks ugly. Like the main house, I decided to keep it simple. Logs, stone, basically any block that I could easily find around me. And I went with a simple log cabin design, just to keep consistent theme with the area. As you can see, it took quite a bit of time to get this design down because I was incredibly picky, but once I knew exactly what I wanted, everything just fell into place. Though I do feel that the time I spent on this, I honestly could have done something better, but oh well. This is what we have, a simple cabin. Anyways, this cabin was going to be making iron, so that's what really mattered. The whole setup was running perfectly, and now it was time to move on to the next project. You see, we were going to have to automate rubber. Now to do this, I wasn't going to remake an entire tree farm. I was just going to use the one we already had, so the plan was to swap out the oak trees for the rubber trees. I broke down all the trees, and after that, it was simply a matter of breaking up the saplings and replacing them with the new rubber tree saplings. I put them in the deployers, and once I activated it, the trees were planted, and once they were chopped down, they were transferred via portable storage interface into a storage unit below. All the tree drops would come out of a funnel, go down into a chute, and then they'd be sorted. One side for saplings, the other for sticks, and the chest for the logs. 
The next thing I added to the setup was a mixer, and after that, it was simply a matter of giving the mixer and the belt power. I went behind the setup and began installing some water wheels. After that, the machine, it came to life. Shortly after, I began configuring the mixer because it was spinning too slow for it to actually work. I was able to produce sap by grinding the logs with a millstone, and when the sap went into the basin, the mixer was then lowered and it mixed it up into rubber. There you can see there's the rubber and I applied a filter so that it only made rubber. After that, I was storing it in this crate right here, and then after that, I had to add a little, uh, I don't know what you'd call this, like a roof or an overhang, just something to cover up the machine so it wouldn't look so plain. Next, I began working on the roof, and true to the designs of all the other buildings, this one was going to have another wood feel, you know, like a log cabin. Wanted to keep everything consistent because I'm going for a little town here, if you haven't noticed. So yeah, I worked on the roof, used some planks to save some wood, and there it is, the completed structure, and to inaugurate it, I even used some of the rubber to make myself this little cap. What do you think? <laughs> Underneath the tree farm, I began clearing out a bunch of dirt because I had more plans for this area. You see, all the wasted space underneath, well, I wanted to put it to use. So once I was finished terraforming the ground, I made a long journey all the way to the ocean. You see, there's one item I needed that was kelp, and there was a lot of kelp here. I harvest as much as I could because I had plans to make a mechanical belt assembly line. Now, mechanical belts, you need them for almost everything. They're the conveyor belts that get your items from point A to point B. So I was going to farm the kelp here underneath the tree farm. With the underground pool of water now ready, I began planting the kelp one by one. This was going to be a perfect little farm, just enough to make what we needed. And as you can see there, we had the whole thing powered up with a steam engine. That steam engine was going 24-7, and the kelp, once it was harvested, it would come out of that little spout right there. And as you can see, the belt is powering everything. It would go up these chests, be stored in that crate right there. And the idea was that it was going to cook on a campfire. There's a campfire under that belt where the smoke is coming from. You see the kelp's coming out right there. It's supposed to stop at the campfire, so I had to move the chest forward, place the funnel there, and yeah, the kelp would stop. Stop, it would auto cook and once it was done it would go into the crate as cooked kelp. After that I wanted to polish up the area so I began breaking up the dirt, placing it with stone instead. The stone just looks way more cleaner than grass. I even covered up the water because I didn't want to fall in so I covered it up with planks and yeah this is the final setup. It was just a nice clean round room and now we had a way of automating mechanical belts. Perfect. It was time to construct the next building because I had plans to automate even more metals. So I began building a similar foundation to the building next door and the designs were going to be basically identical. I don't know what that was, but anyways, yeah, identical, another cabin, but this one was going to be responsible for producing a different type of metal, not iron, but instead copper. Now, to make copper, it's quite a process, but it all starts here with a seared melter. And the Tinker Smeltery setup was kind of difficult to work with because, well, item pipes don't exist. I have to rely on these crude storage units to transfer items between each block. The setup was going to incorporate millstones because, well, basically everything that you see here, it was dedicating to making lots and lots of clay. So we had the cobblestone generators, we had all the cogs, everything was running. The only thing we needed to make our copper now was a steady source of lava. Thankfully, there was a lava pool nearby, and yes, I had automated lava before, but I didn't want to overextend the lava supply that we were generating. So, why not just use the excess lava that we had out in the wild? I lowered the hose into the lava, then after that I powered the pumps up with a water wheel setup. The next step was to make the pipeline extend all the way to the factory. So I did exactly that, carefully bridging across ravines and even having to dig through the ground because this pipeline, well, it had to be underground. You know how I feel about exposed pipelines. They just look ugly when they're above the ground. So yeah, with that all set up, the next step was to connect it to the building. So I routed the pipeline into the structure and I noticed that my machine was having a cobblestone overload. I'll explain exactly how the machine works, but the goal was to make a lot of clay, and the clay had to be melted down, and to make clay, well, it started with cobblestone. So naturally, I built a cobblestone generator, but it was working too well. Once the cobblestone was cleaned up, it was finally time to use the lava to make viridium, and to do that, you pour lava over seared stone. It was finally time to turn the pipeline on again. You see, I had it running with the water wheels, but I had to connect all the pumps to the power source because the lava can only flow for like eight pipes at a time, and then it stops before you need to put another pump down. 
So yeah, once everything was powered up, and I'm talking about all the pumps, the lava was finally starting to flow all the way to the copper building. As you can see here, I had to lower the hose again because I didn't want the lava flowing out of a pipe with no destination. And there it goes, the lava is moving from the pool all the way to the building. Slowly but surely, and it is very slow, lava takes a long time to move. Speaking of taking a long time, Noah was finally back, and it's been a while since we've last seen him. He was working on a little project. He was trying to automate food because that was his role in this Let's Play. Though he was having a little trouble trying to figure out how the crude storage units works because, you know, they can be a little confusing. But I showed him the wonder of the funnel. I threw some bread down and I showed him that with one funnel acting as an entrance, the one in the back can act as an exit, allowing you to transfer blocks from one belt to another. But yeah, enough of that. These funnels are really annoying to make because you have to toggle every single entrance and input and output, and it gets old. Honestly, it gets old having to route blocks through these crude storage units, but once you do, you have automatic pipelines. And as you can see, the seared stone transferred into the basin there where it's turned into viridium when the lava pours over it. Yes, it worked. Back in Noah's place, he was working on the same machine. Only this time, he finally got it running. Now all he had to do was plant some crops for the machine to actually harvest, but he was able to perfect the item transfer. Back in this metals area, it is now time for the grand reveal of our copper factory, and there it is, a very basic design, but it gets the job done. And there is the grand machine on the inside. I started working on another contraption, and yeah, basically the idea was that we had to combine gold and copper. They were going to be melted down, mixed in a basin, and then stored in that tank that I just placed down. I had the water wheels ready to power the whole setup here, and now it was simply a matter of melting down the metals. I went inside this factory here where I was producing a block called Okrum. To make Okrum, you need to mix lava, deep slate, and compressed sand in a basin together to produce, well, Okrum. So yeah, we had a lot of sand being made. With the cobblestone generator here, blocks were being broken, they were being ground up in the millstones, the gravel would move down the funnel, and once again it would enter another millstone where it would be ground up into sand. It was then put in a basin where it would be smushed into compressed sand. Next, we needed gravel. Thankfully, we had a surplus of gravel from our iron farm. All I had to do was reroute the funnel so that the excess gravel would go into a basin and be pressed into cobbled deep slates. I already had lava flowing in from our first lava source, so once everything was joined together, they would be mixed up and we would now have our okram. Now, why did we need okram? Well, when you ground okram up into a millstone, you get gold, and that is exactly what we needed for the rose gold. We melted down the copper, we also melted down the gold, they were pumped into a basin, and after that, it was simply a matter of mixing the two metals up. Copper, gold, when you put them together, you get rose gold, that pink lava looking metal, and yes, it was powered by water wheels. So now it was time to put the rose gold in a bucket and use it for later. So I took some out with the help of a spout, and I wanted to see if it had the same properties as lava, and it turns out that it did. Yeah, don't play with molten metal, it's basically lava. I went back to collect my stuff because now it was time to get serious. Well, almost. I had a player head and I had to place it somewhere, eh, right there and that'll do. And I also wanted to experiment a little more to see if it would mix with lava and it didn't. That is interesting. But yeah, like I said, time to get serious. I combined quartz with redstone to make this rose quartz. I don't know why I couldn't think of that. And then once I put it under the spout, the rose gold was put onto the polished rose quartz and it made an electron tube. Our technology was evolving exponentially because unlike Create Above and Beyond, we were getting into the nitty gritty early in this mod pack, so it was time to produce the next item, microchips. And that was gonna require molten copper as well as some wires. Anyways, it was time to set this up. I had everything I needed here, the belts, I had the machines, I even had the seared smelter that was gonna melt down the copper and put it in the spout. There it is, the final setup. Now it was simply a matter of powering it, water wheels, you guessed it, and now we had to put the copper into the seared melter where it was going to convert it into the molten copper. When the copper was melted down, the molten metal was then transferred via pump into a tank where it was stored until it was needed in the spout, checking off one of our required items. For the next item we needed to make a roller, and basically rollers do just that, they roll metals. 
Now, we needed the roller because we needed wires. I temporarily placed it on the conveyor belt just to give it some power. I attached some cogwheels to the sides, and once the machine came to life, it was simply a matter of figuring out how it worked because it took me a while before I got it down. All you had to do was place the ingots at the very top. But that was my first mistake. You see, when you put ingots into the roller, you don't get wire, you get what's called rods. And I don't want rods, I need wires. The solution to my problem was simple. Instead of putting in the ingots, I had to put them in the form of sheets. I put a gold sheet in and I ended up getting a gold wire. The gold wire was just what I needed because I was gonna use it to make a template. I poured some molten gold over the wire and it left a hollow impression where I could pour other metals in to make even more wires. Now that I had the template, I went back to the factory where I placed the template down on a table and I infinitely began pouring as much copper as I needed to make a lot of copper wire. Now copper wire was essential to making the redstone microchips, so I needed a lot. It was auto pouring, cooling, and then the wire was being stored in the chest below. The setup was finally complete. Here's how the setup works. The items were first being sprayed with copper. The deployer was installing wires in the electron tubes, and then after that, they were smashed with a mechanical press. They had to rotate around a few times, but once they made the rotation, they were finally converted into redstone microchips. Now that we had a means of producing these microchips, it was time to move on to the next phase of our goal. I had to make a setup called an electrolyzer, and it was pretty big. It's an oxygen machine. It makes oxygen for going to space. And to do that, we first had to get a bucket of shimmer, that's what it's called, and we needed a nature compass. Thankfully, making it was easy. All you had to do was spray some molten metal over it, and it converted. The reason we needed the compass was because it was the only way of tracking down the nearest pool. I took a compass, put it on the depot, and shortly after, the conversion was made. We now had our nature compass. Oh, no, I guess it's called an explorer's compass. But aside from that, it tracks structures for you. But before I went off on my expedition, I was due for some much needed armor upgrades. Iron armor. I don't know why it took me so long to get this iron armor, but it did. Now, I had it, I was protected, I was ready to go, and the next thing I did was set the compass for the Shimmer Lake. It gives you the coordinates, so it's simply a matter of just walking there. And it turns out that the lake is underground. So I did some digging, and it was a lot of digging because this thing was basically at the deep slate level. I fell down into this pool of what looked like Pepto-Bismol? I don't know, it was purple. But yeah, it was quite a sight to behold. I swam around in the pool of shimmer finding these underwater minecarts with chests in them. The loot wasn't that great, but it was interesting. Thankfully, I had a lot of buckets on me, and so I was able to scoop up all the shimmer that I needed, and the last thing I did was set a waypoint because I was probably gonna need to come back here later. I'm a pretty forgetful person, so this was essential. Anyways, I made my way back home, and with all the buckets I collected, there was gonna be more than enough shimmer to suit our purposes, that being building a moon portal. Yeah, that's right, we're not building a rock at this time, we are making a portal to the moon. In order to build our portal frame, we were gonna need moonstone, and the only way to get moonstone was from the fallen meteorites you could supposedly find around the world, or in the shimmer lakes, where I had to return to just like I thought I would. Unfortunately, there was no stone, only sand. Though I didn't lose hope, because there was one more place I could possibly find some, and that was in the abandoned minecarts that you found in the mine shafts. And the minecarts are already rare as it is, but finally, I found some. And it was just the amount I needed. If you're a real Minecraft player, then you know that you do not build a portal with corners, because that's simply a waste of blocks. So, I only needed 10. The next step was to pour the shimmer over the moonstone to make it into shimmering stone, and the animation for this is really cool. It was a simple setup. I had the shimmering stone being pumped into a spout, I replaced a depot for a basin, and all I had to do was place the block in the basin, the spout did its thing, and well, look at this. It's like the block comes to life. You know, there are cracks in there and they begin to glow and they change color and it's just wow. With the shimmering stone now complete, it was finally time to build our portal. And yes, like I said before, you don't build a portal with corners. You just use any waste blocks that you have there. Anyways, the portal frame was done. Now we had to ignite it, not with flint and steel, but instead with this diamond looking item. And it was expensive! A diamond block? A chip? Flint and steel? Oh well, you gotta do what you gotta do. Anyways, I threw all of the items into a mixer. They were mixed up together and combined to create what was called an astral conduit. 
basically a really expensive flint and steel. You right click one of the blocks and the portal activates. But we couldn't go to the moon just yet, there were a couple more things that we had to check off the list. For example, we needed to finish the electrolyzer because we needed oxygen for our spacesuit, which was gonna come later. Anyways, to build the electrolyzer, I was gonna need some copper blocks, but first I prepped the area where I was gonna build it. After that, I gathered some copper to begin making the base blocks for the machine, those base blocks being the copper casings. I used the assembly line that we had used for the microchips and just repurposed it to make casings instead. It worked perfectly. Plenty of copper casings were being made, more than we really needed, but yes, we had a purpose for these blocks. Not only were they going to act as the base for the electrolyzer, but we were also going to use them to make the electrolyzer block, and for that we needed all sorts of items. Once again, we were depending on the roller to produce those items. Copper wires and such. We were going to take the copper wires and we were going to use them to create the electrolyzer block. And yes, that is where the oxygen is coming from. I began by building a 3x3 base of copper casings. Next, I was going to need what was called a copper coil block. To do that, I had to craft spools. Basically, they're these things that you wrap the wires around, and with nine copper spools, you get a copper coil block. And I needed eight copper coil blocks, so yeah, a lot of numbers, a lot of math, a lot of copper. At this point, the setup was almost complete. I'd say it was about 75% of the way there. To make the oxygen, I had to supply the machine with water. I also had to craft a block called an oxygen loader. With this block, I would be able to supply my suit with all the oxygen I needed for the moon. And crafting this was annoying because it needed a lot of parts that I also had to craft, so yeah, it was a chore. I placed it down, looked at the interface, and it shared with you how much oxygen was in the machine ready for your suit. Next, I needed an infinite water source, and I saw one YouTuber craft what looked like a sink, and I was able to craft it too, and yes, the sink provided infinite water. Question was, was it going to be compatible with the setup that I already had? I set up a little water pump system, and when I checked the machine, it didn't look like much was happening. The charts weren't indicating that any conversion of water to oxygen was taking place at all. So this led me to believe that this sink was not the proper block. We were going to have to do a generic setup with a regular pump, and yes, it started working. The water was flowing into the electrolyzer, and the oxygen was being put into the oxygen loader. The setup was finally complete, and now there was only one thing standing between me and the rest of the moon, and that was the spacesuit. That's right, I had to craft another spacesuit. And to make this happen, I was going to need sturdy sheets, which meant I needed powdered obsidian. I washed some magma blocks until they cooled off into obsidian, and once I had the obsidian blocks, I threw them into a millstone where they were ground up into the powder. Now, with the obsidian powder, there was another thing I had to do, get it stamped multiple times until it became a sturdy sheet. And these things, they had to get stamped, I don't know, I, that's what I don't like about Create Astral. You gotta do things multiple times. Anyways, once I had the sheets, I was able to make the helmet and every other piece that required it. I now had the full spacesuit. All that was left to do now was to load it up with oxygen. So I went to the oxygen loader and guess what I did? I put the suit in the oxygen loader and it did its job and it worked beautifully. Now we were ready for the unknown. We were ready to go to the moon once again. I looked at the portal and anticipated what was waiting for me on the other side. What monsters, what structures, what mysteries? I stepped in, and yes, it was finally time to make our big comeback. Now I do want to add, because some people will ask, this is not the same moon mod. This is completely different from the moon mod of Create Above and Beyond. So yes, we're not getting back to the base just yet, because there's so much more we have to do. We still have to build up an arsenal, and we were going to start right here. Here. Naturally, I was curious as to what I would find in this area, so I began exploring, and this place had a lot to see. It didn't take long before I came across what looked like the ruins of an old building, and inside of the building, lots of blocks I had yet to discover. There was this orange, slime looking block called Icor. I began harvesting some of the blocks to take it back to base for analysis. There was also other blocks that I did not know what function they served, but you know what, it was good to take them because I was not going to craft these later. Anyways, this building had served its purpose, it was time to keep exploring and see what else the moon had to offer, so I kept venturing off until I came across similar structures that were also in ruins. 
There must have been a civilization on this moon. Something must have happened because there's a lot of stuff here, but no one to claim ownership of them. There were also chests, and inside, Desh. The ore native to the moon. You couldn't find it anywhere in the overworld, so we were going to collect all the Desh we could. I kept exploring the lunar landscape, seeing meteor sites with all the moonstone we needed. Guess it wasn't pretty hard to come by in these parts. But anyways, in some of the meteors, there were Desh veins. All the Desh I could mine. And honestly, I don't know what I'm going to do with this stuff, but it's there and it looks important. I came across this cave as well, and one of the ores was moon cheese. I don't know what you do with moon cheese. I don't know why it's mineable. Can you eat it? Who knows, but I was taking it with me, but that's when I spotted a local. What looked like an alien villager shooting crystals at me, and he was doing damage. I had to get out of there, and by that point my oxygen was starting to lower and I did not know what I wanted to do, so I decided to explore the local ravine that was right by the portal just to play it safe. And guess what? There was another alien villager, and I didn't have any weapons on me. I was gonna die! So I decided to retreat and come back with more proper gear, such as a weapon. As soon as I got back, I began the preparations for the next expedition. I put more oxygen in my spacesuit, I began crafting bullets for my gun, and then I even upgraded the pickaxe that I had been using with Fortune to get more dash. I was ready to go back. I hopped into the portal, excited to figure out what else I was going to discover in this new world. Yes, there was even an Earth, and it looked amazing. Anyways, it was nighttime. I did not know that there was a nighttime on the moon, but you know what, that kind of makes sense because it rotates around the sun. I don't know how it works, but I attacked the first thing I saw, the villager who tried to kill me. Once that was taken care of, I began mining some of this glowstone, and if you don't know, basically this dimension acts as a substitute for nether items. You see, there's no nether in Create Astral. You have to find all of the nether items on the different planets, like glowstone, which we can find here on the moon, which I am now using as a torch, because this area is pitch black. There were also other ores, like that quartz I just mined. There was a lot of stuff I had to gather on this planet, or moon, our moon's planets. I went deep into the cave, all the way to the bottom lava layer, and that was a lot of damage. For some reason, I thought that the gravity would negate my damage, it did not. It was time to keep mining, but there was another corrupted Lunarian. That's what the villagers are called. And these things have the accuracy of professional snipers. I almost died, but thankfully he burned in the lava and I was able to continue my mining expedition. Mining what was this moon ice shard. Now, I don't know what ice shards were for, so I decided to look it up. A feature that I greatly overlooked, but not until I mined this silver ore. Now, silver, I'm sure that had some utility. I mean, silver is very valuable. But anyways, as for the ice shards, what did they do? Well, you guessed it, you can make ice with them. Other than that, I don't know what you use them for. I guess you could use them in this cryo freezer, kind of? Maybe. But I kept going, and then I found cobalt, another Tinker's Construct metal that is known for its strong, durable nature. This was going to be great for making the perfect Tinker's Construct tools. I love cobalt. I kept mining, and I discovered another deposit of moon cheese. And this time, I decided to end this mystery. I wanted to know what it was for, so I decided to just go for it. I gathered some moon cheese, put it in my hot bar, and guess what? You can eat it. You can actually eat the stuff. I don't know why I was eating it, it gave me good health, but yeah. I was gonna continue exploring, but not before checking out the roadmap for the moon world. Turns out that there were two paths to follow, the path of brass and the path of silver. The Path of Silver specializes in electricity, while the Path of Brass is focused more on machines that'll help us later. So that's what we were gonna do, the Path of Brass. And to do this, we had to explore and find a pipeline. So once again, I was off, when all of a sudden, I stumbled across this massive structure. What looked like the cooler for a nuclear reactor. This thing was huge, and I wondered if there was anything inside, and guess what? There was. This place was full of shimmer. That rare liquid that we had to use the compass for to locate, this place was just overflowing with it. I decided to go into the center because I saw something that caught my attention. A chest, and inside, there were plenty of parts for other machines as well as iron plating and lots of cogwheels. And the best part was that this chest was the first of many. There were multiple chests all over the building containing various loot that was going to be useful. 
I basically spent the whole night there until the sun rose, and by that point my inventory was overflowing with all of these new items. I swam to the top of this shimmer waterfall just to see if there was anything up there that I could have missed, and yeah, there were even more chests, and inside of them, even more loot. The big question was, what was at the very top? The only way to find out was by breaking through the wall and climbing up just to see for myself, but before I did, I took in the view and the ruins of other structures nearby. After that, I began climbing to the top, and it was just as I had suspected. It wasn't much, but it was a nice view. So yeah, that place had that going for it. Anyways, it was time to move on, and there I saw another structure. This one looked like a tower, like a lighthouse, and inside, more aliens, but these ones looked different. They didn't resemble the enemies that we had encountered earlier, but I was cautious. No, these guys were friendly. As a matter of fact, these Lunarians were the normal versions of the corrupted Lunarians. They were being attacked, but once I put down the enemy, I was able to move on and further explore the structure. Now, this was not a lighthouse. It looked like a giant vehicle. I don't know what it was, maybe it was a train or a spaceship or something, but this place was big and it was full of rooms. Unfortunately, I can't say that it was full of loot, though it was fun to explore. I kept venturing through the halls of this ruined structure, hoping to find something. I mean, yes, it was fun exploring, but I was in it for the gear, for the items, for the potential wealth, and unfortunately, there was nothing like that here. So it was time to move on. I walked all the way to the very end, what I assume was the control room, and this place was in shambles. Nothing to be gathered, nothing left, not even a survivor. I took one last good look at this area, and after that I was pretty satisfied, it was time to move on. As I continued exploring, I then came across what looked like the crater of an impact site for a giant meteor. And the meteor? Well, I always have to mine down the middle of a meteor because, well, that's why. There was a chest and plates so that we could make more machines. Yes, this was becoming a fruitful expedition, but we still had to find our pipeline. And in this moment, it looked like we found it. This underground passage. Surely there was a pipeline down here, and no, it ended up being a type of villager base. A space base? Yeah, a space base. For all of these Lunarians, and I couldn't trade with them, but I could steal some of their loot. I continued wandering around looking inside the chest to see if there was anything of great value, but no. So I moved on, and I continued mining more dash as I was making my return back because my oxygen was at 26%. It was time to go home. Yes, there was a lot to do on the moon, there was a lot to explore, but by this point we had reached day 100 and it was finally time to rest and count our gear. Mark my words, revenge is on the way, but we have to be ready. I don't know what Robert's cooking up on the moon, but it's certainly not going to be to our advantage. That's going to be it for today's video. If you want 700 days, be sure to leave a like and comment down below. Thank you so much for watching, and thank you to our patrons for supporting today's video. I will see you next time. This has been Double Sal. Thanks for watching.